Hello and welcome to the Sandeep Roy show on Express Audio. The Sandeep Roy show. Banaras, Varanasi, Kashi, whatever you call it, is a city that's steeped in symbolism for Hindus. We know it as a city of temples and alleyways, wandering cows and mystics, Ganga Aarti, Bismillah Khan, and now the Kashi Vishwanath Corridor. It's been the atmospheric setting for famous films, Opera Jito in Shatrajit Ray's Apu Trilogy, to Jolly LLB2 to Ram Teri Ganga Maheli. Varanasi is sacred to many Hindus who believe that if you're cremated at its famous Manikarnika Ghat, you will obtain moksha or salvation. But most of us know little about the lives of the domes who work those ghats, giving the dead a chance at that salvation. Radhika Aenga spent several years following the lives of the domes of Varanasi through many ups and downs. And her remarkable book, Fire on the Ganges, Life Among the Dead in Banaras, talks about the dreams and aspirations of the community whose job it is to help others find salvation. But who will help them? Radhika Anger, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sandeep. It's such a pleasure. How does it begin? You're from another city, another caste, another world almost, to be honest. How do you even make that first point of entry in a community like the domes of Varanasi? I was working on a thesis project and uh, I found an article about the dome community and I immediately got very interested in learning more about them. And so I went to Banaras, I went to Manikarnika Ghat and uh, initially I remember it was just a very different place, completely different. There is life everywhere. Even the Manikarnika Ghat is supposed to be the land of the dead. It's a cremation ground. But there was so much life. There were wood sellers, there were shavyatris who are a group of men who come with the cops to deliver the cops to Manikarnika Ghat. There were men who sold samagri. And, um, you know, if you're a female journalist and if you have a dictaphone in one hand, a notebook in another and a camera uh, dangling from your neck, you are bound to draw attention. There was an overwhelming presence of men over there. And of course, there were the cops burners as well. And so when I approached them, because I was very, quite visibly someone from a dominant caste and class and an outsider, they weren't very receptive to my presence. First of all, I'm a stranger and I approached them. And if a stranger approaches you, you're not going to share the most personal details about your life. Right. So they were quite taken aback. And there was also a point where they didn't want to interact with me. And also because I'm a woman. So they weren't used to a woman approaching them and asking them questions. And so I took that as a challenge and I decided to step back and I would sit at Manikarnika Ghat and just observe how everything was functioning over there, how the dome men interacted with each other, how the copses were laid, how the pyres were built. That really enriched my ethnographic process in one sense. And then because I kept returning to Manikarnika Ghat, I think the men over there, the cops burners, realized that I am doing something which I'm very serious about. I'm not someone who's just coming one day and saying, okay, tell me about your life and then disappearing and then having no contact with them at all. They realize I'm very committed to the documentation of their lives. So that was my, I think, entry point. And of course, I went to Chan Ghat, you know, which is a dome basti. It's, of course, I've given it a fictitious name only to protect the identity of the neighborhood and of the people over there. But it is a basti where I had the opportunity of uh, meeting the dome women, the elders over there as well. And um, because I kept returning, I think, over a period of time, there became this kind of, uh, you know, the inhibitions began sort of peeling or falling away. And they weren't suspicious about what your intentions? No, they weren't suspicious. They were very curious as to why I was interested in learning about their lives. So I did sit down with them and explain to them that I am writing a book and that I'm keen on learning about the community, their rituals, their traditions. What is the perspective about death? Because they are dealing with the business of death. What is the perception of death? What is the perception of life? 
what about the women do the women have any aspirations are they invited to take part in family discussions are they invited to be part of family decision making can they step out of the house on their own and earn a living what kind of agency they have as well as the children i don't think anyone wants to grow up to become a corpse burner so how do they think about their future and they are told by society that their entire life exists at this cremation ground so these were the questions that were lingering in my mind and you mentioned that you gave the dome basti a fictitious name to protect it to protect it from what i mean do the people around not know that that area is a dome neighborhood so the locals will know but the thing is i wanted to protect the identity of the people who i've interviewed primarily because individuals like komal and lakshya who have really fought the odds they had of course an intercaste marriage we should just mention lakshya is from the dom community komal is a brahmin yes yes and i remember when i was speaking to komal and lakshya both of them requested me to not reveal their identities because of a potential backlash that they might face and even dolly who is in my book she is this young widow who is the mother of five children and in order to uh, make a livelihood she opens this small shop at the threshold of her one room home she of course believed that her husband sikond lal was murdered she has been throwing these allegations at uh, these two men who she believes have murdered her husband so i wanted to protect her identity as well you know people have this impression of banaras as the ghats temples narrow alleys and now of course this ganga aarti big tourist ritual that keeps happening but what is the neighborhood where the domes live like how far is it in fact from manikannika ghat where the cremations take place um so chan ghat is a place where there is hustle and bustle every day you know it is hard to find because it's stuck deep uh, inside the city and it's away from the public eye so to even find chan ghat unless you go looking for it you won't be able to find it it's a place where there are these two story um, mud and brick buildings each home is this small cramped one room home um and there are six to seven family members sometimes more living in each of these homes these small buildings they are colored in you know pea green and baby pink and light blue colors there are hand paintings on the wall and when you enter there are a lot of um children playing around there are a lot of playful shrieks of children it's a very welcoming place each of the homes have no address plate or no name plate either on it and at night partitions are pulled up through you know using curtains uh like bed sheets actually they're put up to make space within that one room home for um the families to live properly i'm it must have taken a while for the men to trust you enough to allow you entry into the neighborhood the home I, because when i read the book and you said that initially as a woman it was easier to talk to the women whereas the men were a little more guarded i had thought that that had been your point of entry that you had met the women and then through them the men but it seems like what you're saying it was actually the other way around in one sense that is true and uh, the women like i said they were easier to sit down with and have conversations with the men if i share the example of meeting mohan for the first time he was quite an intimidating presence he was quite reserved and he um was a man of few words so initially like i said he would give me these one line answers when i asked him questions later on what happened was over a period of time because i was meeting him and asking him questions about what he does and how he feels being at the cremation ground uh, slowly slowly he started opening up to me more for example he started voluntarily giving me information about what he did on a daily basis So I was once at Manikarnika Ghat and he was doing um something called dhulna which locally means to wash. So what happens is that the dome men when they are not burning corpses they um come to the river and they immerse themselves they are waist deep in the water and they sift the ash 
and uh, they do so to find uh, small pieces of gold or silver jewelry which have been melted in the pyre so when he was sifting the ash in the water i was sitting on a boat and i was just observing him and the other men who were doing that work so he himself approached me he came closer and he showed me the contents of the ash in the tasla which is this uh, shallow wide mouthed uh, vessel which the domen used to sift ash and he showed me the contents and he said hadi mitti rak sab hai isme and he pulled out uh, this small piece of bone and he told me that this uh, belongs to the foot of a man is this when you first threw up uh no that was when i uh, met akash i did make the mistake of standing very close to one of the pyres and to explain it it's just this immense heat that radiates from the pyres and there is this thick smoke which um goes and settles deep within your lungs and it's very difficult to breathe properly over there and the ash swirls and stings your eyes you know you can't see properly and it's just you get dehydrated very quickly so for me one of the first times i went to manikandika ghat and it was very difficult for me to be there and that's when i vomited and it also goes to show that the corpse burners work there on a daily basis in these conditions they sometimes burn their hands because they're stoking pyres with bamboo sticks sometimes they injure their they actually they injure themselves quite a bit and uh, they'll also sometimes accidentally step on hot ash that has fallen from the pyres and it's very difficult to work over there and they do it every day for a very pitiable amount of money yeah you know i was kind of surprised also because uh, i think you mentioned that they were made about 150 rupees per corpse in the book and then i think you said that now it's gone up a little bit 200 to 250 rupees a corpse give us a little sense of what the economy is like there because it's not just the corpse burning that's happening there are all kinds of other livings being made at the cremation grounds you mentioned dhulna little while ago of sifting what else is happening so uh, apart from dhulna i can talk about the shroud because the children from the dome community they are unfortunately pushed out of their homes at a very young age as young as 5 to 6 year olds who go to the cremation ground and uh, they are expected to scavenge for kafan or shrouds which are these fabrics that come draped on corpses that are delivered at manikanika ghat and these fabrics or shrouds come in different colors of yellow golden orange red and when the body is put on the pyre this particular fabric is cast aside and the children then pick these shrouds and they sell it to a shopkeeper and the shopkeeper then washes it and packages it and then resells it to morning customers but the children they earn uh, some way between 2 rupees to 15 rupees per shroud and again they are working in this very dangerous environment and they work sometimes very late into the night i've seen children working at 10 o'clock 11 o'clock at manikanika ghat trying to pick these shrouds it's interesting because i remember uh, speaking to shortcut who is one of the individuals in my book and he used to be a shroud picker and he said after a point of time ek tarah ka nasha ban jata hai because you start picking shrouds and you start making some money and you get addicted to the idea of making money at a very young age and you're also very aware of the value of money at a very young age and are these shroud picker children only the boys or do little girls also do this no only the boys the girls uh, stay back at home and they help their mothers with the household responsibilities people burn corpses all over the country are the domes of other cities like do they all belong to the same community or is there something special about the domes of banaras uh so there is something special about the domes of banaras and uh, primarily because banaras and manikarnika ghat and harishchandra ghat which is the other cremation ground it is believed that if a hindu is cremated at one of these cremation grounds then they receive moksha which is uh, salvation or liberation from 
the cycle of death and rebirth. And it's also believed that unless you are cremated using the sacred fire, which belongs to the domes in Banaras, you will not achieve moksha. And only the domes have sole ownership of the sacred fire. Where is this fire? It's burning at Manikarnika Ghat. If you recall reading in the book, there is, uh, I call it the unofficial headquarters of the dome maliks who sit there. And then they are the ones who give this fire. People watch over it all the time so that it's always burning. And that leads me to the question, you mentioned the dome maliks. Talk a little bit about the hierarchy within the domes. You know, from who's the corpse burner, who's the malik, is there mobility within that hierarchy? So within the dome community, the dome maliks are at the topmost level of the class hierarchy. They are uh, the wealthy domes who hold uh, something called a pari. And a pari is a rota system which is monopolized by the maliks. It is um, something like a shift which may consist of four days or 11 days, um, sometimes even nine days at a stretch. And under each malik, there are one or two managers who oversee the proper functioning of the cremation ground. And they also do um, bookkeeping and other things. And below them are the cops burners like Mohan, um, who are recruited by the Maliks to do the cremation work. So they are the ones who set up the pyres and stoke the pyres. And Pari can be gifted, sold, um, bought or even mortgaged. So sometimes the domes, when they don't have enough money, then they put their uh, pari on mortgage. And then sometimes they can buy it back, the pari. And if they can't, then they sort of have to forfeit it. Most people's encounter with the world is that brief moment when you have taken a body in and you deal with it. It's kind of it's really fascinating to know how complicated and complex the system is. But I wanted you to tell the story which you recount in the book about when we talk about the domes of Benares especially, is the legend that they have ascribed themselves about who they are descended from. It's very evocative about who they are and you're both outcast, as, but you also see yourself with a lot of pride. There's this legend that they circulate that Goddess Parvati lost one of her earrings at Manikarnika Ghat. And of course, Lord Shiva was looking everywhere for it and could not find it. And one uh, man who happened to be a Brahmin, he found the earring and instead of giving it back to Parvati, he pockets it. And of course, eventually Lord Shiva learns about it and he's angered by it. And so he curses the culprit and the generations after him to belong to the lowest rung of the caste hierarchy. And of course, this man pleads to Lord Shiva and he says, please forgive me. And eventually his heart melts and then he gives this boon, which is the sacred fire to this man. And he says that you and the generations that will follow you will have ownership of the sacred fire. And only through the sacred fire, any Hindu who is cremated can that Hindu soul receive moksha. And of course, the domes are believed to be descendants of this particular man. The domes believe that they are the chosen ones by Shivji. And there is immense pride in what they do, that they are the only ones who can provide moksha. And so I remember I was speaking to Santosh Chaudhary, who is a chief operator at the electric crematorium. Well, now it's the gas-powered crematorium, and he belongs to the dome community. And uh, I asked him that, don't you think anyone from any other caste can cremate? And he was immensely offended when I asked him. He said, this is our birthright. And that is something no other caste can take away from us. And he said, you know, we would be able to use the camera that you're holding right now. But neither you or anyone from a dominant caste and class will want to touch a dead body or want to do the work that we do, which is cremating the dead. They're very protective about their identity as the only ones who can give moksha. And they're very proud of it also. But somewhere, um, Sandeep, I feel that they are perpetuating, unwittingly perpetuating this narrative of oppression. Because at the end of the day, no one from a privileged caste and class will want to do this work. 
it makes yourself feel a little better about the doing the work that nobody else wants to do. But you mentioned Santosh Chaudhary and what was fascinating also is that this pride goes to the extent where he's the one who's guarding the, you know, he's managing the gas crematorium. But when you ask him how he wants to be cremated, he's quite candid that he wants to be cremated traditional style on a wooden pyre. Yes, yes, absolutely. I feel that uh, this belief that you can only achieve moksha if you are cremated at the river bank of the river Ganga, and if you're cremated using firewood with the sacred fire, that is the only way one can achieve moksha. So if you're cremated at an electric crematorium or a gas-powered crematorium, you will not achieve moksha in any way. So even Santosh says that, that he wants to be cremated the traditional way. And the fact that you mentioned about the domes trying to justify their place in society, that's true. The fact that they are proud of, you know, their ability to give moksha is like you mentioned, and I've also mentioned this in the book, that they're trying to give some significance and value to the work they do and their identity in a society that otherwise completely ignores them and treats them as untouchables. So this is their way of claiming some kind of uh, religious capital in society. Yeah, because there's a very poignant quote, which I can't remember who says that, you know, where somebody says that whether you're a prince or a pauper, in the end, you'll have to come and fall at the feet of a dome. That comes in juxtaposition with all kinds of other daily indignities and humiliations that you suffer. Can you give some examples about those kinds of day-to-day indignities that you have to face, even though you're the one who will ultimately give moksha to somebody from an upper caste who dies? I can answer this by giving you examples of my experience as a reporter while I was reporting in Chan Ghat. So, for instance, I remember... When I used to go to Manikarnika Ghat from Chan Ghat, there would be some children would always accompany me and walk with me and we would talk about many things. But there was one alley that they would always avoid, which was a shorter route to Manikarnika Ghat. But they would always say, Didi, idha se chalo, dusri taraf se chalo, you know, and we'll take a longer route. And one day I asked them, I asked them why you're avoiding one particular gully. And they told me that there is a temple there where the priest shoes them away and the priest doesn't want them anywhere near the temple because they are dome children. And if you as a child grow up with that kind of wrath from a priest or if you are told that you are an untouchable and if you are always belittled and made to feel that you are of no value, then that really impacts you as a child. And so, you know, in newspapers, we will read about the horrific lynchings and the horrific honor killings. And these are like terrible acts of violence. But there are smaller acts of violence that occur on a daily basis, such as the one example I just mentioned. This is what they've experienced on a daily basis, that you are good for nothing and your life begins at the cremation ground and it'll end at the cremation ground. Because I think as a journalist, When there is a horrible lynching, you go to the scene of the crime, you ask what has happened and stuff. But we don't often think about these small day-to-day indignities, you know, because those are not newsworthy. And I don't know if this was like your sort of first really deep encounter with people who live with these day-to-day indignities every way, even if they are not being lynched, you know, or, you know, those kinds of crimes may not be happening to them. But these little things keep happening every day. And the toll it takes on them. Yeah. uh, See, when before I began reporting, I was very much aware of the prevalence of caste-based violence and caste discrimination that exists in our country. It's so widespread. But I think when I began speaking to the individuals in the community, when I began knowing them on a personal level and hearing from them their own experiences, what they encounter, that really hit me at another level. Because as someone who is, and I speak for all of us, when we read it in the newspapers, we're always very detached from something that is happening. That I mean, from that incident, because you're reading about it. 
But when you are physically there, listening to people and hearing the first-hand experiences, then it impacts you in a different way. For instance, I remember speaking to uh, the community members and Dolly was, of course, she told me that when they go, there's a particular shopkeeper who belongs to the dominant caste. And when they go and buy certain items from the shopkeeper, he always asks them to place the money on the counter. And if there is some change to be returned, he'll ask them to cup their hands so that he can drop it into their palms because he doesn't want to accidentally touch them. Even though people will say, oh, you know, things have changed and we are more uh, liberal minded as a society. We're not. So yes, it deeply impacted me and I'm human at the end of the day. So just getting to know the children and realizing that some of them will not have the opportunity of getting a proper education because they are expected to go to Manikarnika Ghat and work. How will the kitchen run? That's what one of the children told me. If we don't work. So their priority in life is no longer about themselves or, you know, what they want to grow up to become. Their priority right now is to earn money so that they can contribute towards the household finances. They should be in school. They should be studying. They should be thinking about their future. They shouldn't be thinking about, oh, I'm going to grow up to become a cops burner. And what do people in the community think about those who don't want to grow up and become a corpse burner? You follow a story like Bhola, who wants to get out of the, get an education, get out, make something for himself. And, you know, poignantly is, goes to a college far away in Ludhiana and where he doesn't reveal to his classmates what his background is and where he comes from and all of that. But um, what do the community think of people like him? So the community is very impressed by Bhola. They hold him in deep respect and they really feel that he's representative of a particular change. The fact that he has been so resolute on his path to achieve everything he set out to achieve, it gives them hope that if Bhola can do it, then certainly someone else can do it from the community. So they really look up to him. And Bhola is someone who is really strong-willed and he's so intelligent and so focused in everything that he does. He doesn't let anything come in his way. And he also wants to bring about change in his community. So he, for instance, wants girls to be educated. So he's actually convinced his uh, siblings to allow his nieces to travel with him to Chennai and get an education, which is a big deal for the community because girls otherwise who are 14, 15 years old, they are pulled out of schools. And then they have to start planning for the future as married women. But does that not lead to any backlash where people say, if everybody becomes a bhola, then who will guard the sacred flame anymore? So I'll tell you something very interesting, which George Gray, who is this American sponsor for the education of four dome boys. And uh, I asked him what his experience was like. And he said, you know, when I was talking to one of the locals in Banaras about my interest in helping the boys from the community get an education, the man turned around and asked him, Murda kon jalayega? Who is going to burn the dead? I mean, it speaks volumes of where we are as a society, where those in power don't want the powerless to progress or move forward in any way. So this man felt like if every dome boy grows up to be educated and then has the opportunity to different alternative professions, then none of them will want to burn the dead. And that's going to be very problematic. But it's also interesting because it also goes the other way because, you know, when you, we talked about the gas crematorium and the fact that many within the dome community also opposed the electric crematorium when it started, right? Because uh, I assume because they thought it was interfering with their traditions and their way of making a living. Yeah, it does. And they were against the construction of the electric crematorium primarily because it would interfere with their only source of making a livelihood, which is 
burning bodies traditionally. So yes, there was a pushback, but eventually the electric crematorium was established in um, the late 80s. And it continues to exist to this day. But unfortunately, it is not as popular as the traditional uh, method of cremation. And so even though the electric crematorium is cheaper, is friendly towards the environment, it's safer. But at the same time, it's still not an option for those who believe that the traditional cremation is the only way forward. And is the electric crematorium outside the ambit of the Dome Maliks and Rajas, that yes. ecosystem? So it's a whole separate thing. In fact, I think you say in the book that the only time it became really popular was actually during COVID when there was really, you know, when there's the volume was so high. And now it's back to being... Yeah, I mean, I didn't realize this also that, you know, people were... It wasn't just people dying around there, that it was people coming, bodies being brought from Bihar and places in order to be burnt at Manikarnika Ghat, in which case you would want to go the whole traditional route, I imagine. We've talked a lot about the men, but I wanted to talk about the women. When you profile some remarkable women in the book, like Dolly, who is setting up her own shop, which is unheard of. Now, how is someone like Dolly viewed as an outlier in the Dome community? Is she viewed with the same admiration as you say someone like Bola? That's a very, very interesting question. So Dolly, when she decided to start this shop, it stirred a lot of bitterness and resentment within the community initially because women are not supposed to earn a living. They're not supposed to have any kind of financial independence. And this is a very patriarchal, conservative community. They were not happy about the fact that she has opened a shop and that she's earning because that could potentially encourage other women to also start small businesses maybe and start earning for themselves. Dolly, one of the days when she goes to the main market to buy uh, products for her Kirana store where she sells chips and namkeens and cold drinks and whatnot. She goes and she leaves her children in the care of her sister-in-law who lives upstairs. And Dolly, of course, lives on the ground floor. And when Dolly returns home, there is this overwhelming smell of shit. Someone has thrown cow dung from her window into her home. And so, yes, the community was not in favor of Dolly's ambition in one sense. Through the book, I'm trying to track her trajectory because initially during this period, before she starts this shop, she is very naive and trusting. And then over a period of time, she becomes this very astute businesswoman, a very no-nonsense businesswoman. And she does this because she has this sheer resilience to really battle any kind of backlash she receives. So if you talk about gender, then yes, I feel that certainly when while they look up to someone like Bhola, they were not looking up to someone like Dolly. But now I feel in 2023, things are slightly different because when I speak to the women over there in the Dome community in Changhat, they are slowly feeling like if Dolly can do something like this, maybe they can also potentially start a small business and exactly start Exactly what the men were fearing. Yeah, exactly <laughs> that. But the women, I feel like they still don't have it in them. They don't have that kind of confidence. And I feel like Dolly also wouldn't have had that kind of confidence. She was just because she lost her husband and she needed to make money somehow to survive and to support her children, which is why she was forced into something like this. She was compelled to start, you know, open this small shop. And if her husband was still alive, I don't think she would become this spirited woman that she is today. But she realizes this now. When I speak to her, she realizes that even though the loss of her husband was immensely tragic, it was also at the same time transformative for her. But like I said, that other women, even though they feel and they want to, actually start something on their own and start earning but they also are very fearful of the repercussions and yes and they're also very dependent unfortunately on their husbands at the moment 
you know, one of the things that struck me while reading the book, Radhika, was, and which I thought was very admirable, is that while you discuss your own sort of caste privilege um, very openly in the book, you also don't shy away from talking about the problems that they face within the community, not just caste oppression. You know, you don't gloss over those issues about how things like uh, domestic violence is quite normalized. People don't think it's that unusual that you might be a good husband and beat your wife, as well as alcohol and drugs. Unfortunately, domestic violence is something which is quite normal. It is normalized. And I remember Twinkle telling me, Twinkle is uh, Mohan, who's a cop's burner, his wife. And she said, our husbands, and I'll quote her in Hindi, actually, they worship us and they hit us as well. And so they feel that their husbands love them because they take care of them, that they're bringing in the money. But uh, the beatings happen on a day-to-day basis. <laughs> There's a moment where Mohan has come back home and he is decided to not work for that shift of his. And so Twinkle is very agitated because she feels Mohan is at this point being very irresponsible towards his profession and of course his family. And at that time, of course, Kamla Devi, who is Mohan's mother, she's also quite unwell. And so all of those things are also influencing Mohan. He's not mentally in a good place. And so he comes home and Twinkle just takes off at him. She says that you are being irresponsible and you're making me live like a dog. And now you're also going to live like a dog. I think something along those lines she had said. And Mohan had no other way of expressing his anger. And he lifted this steel lid and he flung it towards her. And it hit her on her uh, leg and it bruised her. But this, I mean, she felt horrible about it. But she also felt that because she said what she did, so what Mohan did was, quote unquote, justifiable. And are they bothered about the drinking? And I don't know what, I mean, you mentioned the drugs and drinking and drugs. Do the women see that as a problem? The women see that as problems, of course. They are worried about the drinking. They don't want their husbands to drink. They don't want their husbands to even consume drugs. But mind you, the do men do it to cope with um, these terrible working conditions of working at Manikarnika Ghat. And uh, they do it because they face extreme exhaustion and they have no other way of venting. So they drink and then, of course, unfortunately, they... You know, the women sometimes face their wrath because the men themselves are very discontent about the life that they're leading. And uh, the women sometimes bear the brunt of it. Sometimes the children also bear the brunt of it. Though it was kind of touching, though, uh, when there's a little bit in the book where one of the older women, up when she dies, when she's being cremated, they had a bottle of alcohol on the fire with her because she too liked to drink now and then. It's permissible for the older women to drink. But younger married women, it's something that's looked down upon. But they do? They do very, very rarely. Not not very often. It's mostly the men who drink. How young are people when they start taking drugs and things like that? Is it like, does it go down to children level? So from whoever I spoke to, they always said that around the age of 11 to 12, they start drinking. And like I said, it's... Again, to cope with the stressors of the work that they're doing, these young boys who are working there, either they're picking the shrouds or they're burning copses and they start burning around the age of 13 years old. And so it's not, they don't consume drugs as a way of... Recreation. They don't do it as an, something as, as a recreation. Yeah, I think there's a quote where someone says, you know, at least then our breath smells of liquor and not of a decaying cork. Yeah, that's Akash who says it. Yes. Murda ki mehek ni aati hai. Kam se kam sharaab ki mehek aati hai humare muh se. And the other thing that really struck me was, um, you know, like you, one gets inured to poverty also, but then this is a different level of subsistence. Um, you know, the fact that uh, people bring back some, like the same wood that is being used to burn the corpses, the unburnt bits of the wood 
are being salvaged and scavenged and brought back to be cooking fire fuel for the domes themselves. Or the fact, I think there's a little detail in there where somebody is so hungry, she breaks a clay cup into tiny pieces and then sort of crushes it, mixes it with water and swirls it around their mouth. You know, it's a w strange way to get some calcium. So given that level of um, need and want and poverty, how was COVID for the community? To put it very bluntly, it was, was it good for business? One should remember that these are families that have six to seven family members, sometimes more, and they're living in these very small homes. And so for them to even stay within these small homes for almost all the time due to for quarantine reasons became very oppressive for them. And I remember one of the dome women telling me that every time if anyone wanted to step out of their homes for a stroll, and if in the neighborhood there was a cop patrolling the neighborhood, then he would uh, run after them with a baton and tell them to get back inside their homes. Um, we were all very fearful of what was happening, what was going on. And initially, all the cop spurners, they went inside their homes. They didn't want to work. They didn't want to work at Manika Nikakhar because there was this fear of the disease. And then at that time, Mohan, of course, would tell me that the managers, the dome managers who we spoke about, they would come and pull each of the cops burners out of their homes um, and to go and work at Manikarnika Ghat. But then they also, at one point, they take pride in the fact that, you know, that many of them didn't get vaccinated because they thought... That <coughs> happened at a later stage, though. So I'm telling you about the, the beginning part of uh, mm -hmm. COVID. And then what Mohan also told me was that people were giving him and other cops burners 5,000 rupees, 3,000 rupees to burn their loved ones because there was so much panic at that time. Some family members were just leaving their loved ones behind and abandoning their loved ones, their deceased loved ones and going back. And bodies were piling up. Cops burners like Mohan were being paid 5,000 rupees to cremate one body. Under normal circumstances, uh, like we spoke about earlier, the men would get paid 200 rupees to 50 rupees per cremation. And of course, Mohan earned, uh, Akash earned also quite a bit. And Mohan bought a fridge for himself and he bought a television set. He bought jewelry for his wife. But at what cost? And then Mohan also, over a period of time, became very arrogant because thankfully nothing happened to him. So he became very sure of himself that nothing is going to happen to him. He once told me, like nothing has happened to me. I've burned so many bodies. And then, of course, there was this belief also among the Dome community members that they live at the feet of Lord Shiva. You know, so nothing is going to happen to us. And then there was also this belief that alcohol keeps Corona away. One of them told me and 90% of the community members, like the men drink alcohol. Speaking of people who live at Shivji's feet, do you talk in the book a bit about, you know, the this whole Kashi Vishwanath card beautification project and everything that has been underway? Is there concern among the domes that as part of this sort of beautification and modernization of Banaras, their way of life will be impacted and imperiled? So for someone like Lakshya, who is from the Dome community, but he is a tour guide, he felt very thrilled about the fact that the Kashi Vishwanath corridor was being built at that time when I interviewed him, uh, because he felt that more tourists will come, uh, religious tourism will grow in the city, and then it will benefit tour guides like him. And then I also spoke to the dome elders. And one of them uh, told me that, you know, Shivji lives in every gully. So to break down the gullies really is demolishing the spirit of the city. The city's heritage is being killed. So he was completely against it. And Twinkle said that, you know, all that is great, that the development is taking place. But that development has not reached us. It hasn't reached our Basti yet. And I guess this is the obvious question to sort of end with. But uh, now that the book is out, have any of them 
especially the ones who you know the ones who have um, can speak english and read english read it i was curious what they thought about you know this woman has been coming for 8 years and talking to us and talking to us and finally there is this book out there what does it you know what do they think of it so uh they're all very happy about it they're very excited unfortunately they can't read bhola is the only one who can read and uh, he started reading it so fingers crossed every like he'll he'll be happy about it and you i mean you know people write books and then you move on to the next book and i'm sure you will write more books and uh, wonderful books but uh, even as you move on to the next book do you think you can move on from the people who were part of this book no i don't think i can move on from them i am still very much in touch with each one of them and i keep getting updates about what's going on in their life and uh, shortcut is doing really well i think he has grown phenomenally over the past 8 years and he's of course working and he's also studying simultaneously he doesn't want to work at manikarnika ghat and so um he's tour guide at the moment but uh, he really let's hope that he's able to achieve his dream because he's very inspired by bhola so uh, and of course i'm in touch with lakshay and komal and dolly and uh, mohan akash everyone i'm in touch with everyone radhika anger thank you so much for joining us on the show today thank you thank you for having me over radhika anger is the author of fire on the ganges life among the dead in banaras It just won the Kalinga Literary Award for Youth from the Kalinga Literary Festival. Let us know what you think about this show wherever you get your podcasts from. Find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Express Podcasts. Thanks as always for listening. This show was produced by Shashank Bhargav and edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. This is Sandeep Roy on Express Audio.